Hello. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use to interact with the webcast. You can submit questions to our presenters by using the Q&A widget or interact with other attendees by typing in the group chat widget. If the slide deck has been made available for download, it can be accessed in the available resources widget on the bottom right hand side of your screen. If you are interested in continuing education credits, please click on the sign up widget in order to specify your credit type. In order to qualify for CPE credits, you must stay logged in for the full hour and click on interactive prompts which populate three times throughout the webcast. A recording of this webcast will be made available 24 hours after the live session and will be emailed to all registrants. You can share this webcast with a colleague or friend by clicking on the light blue share icon. Finally, we appreciate your help in improving our webcasts. An evaluation form will appear at the conclusion of this webcast, and your feedback allows us to continually make better content for you. Thank you from all of us at the Conference Board. Hello, and thank you for joining today's special webcast, Mapping the Great Return, Inclusive Support for Working Families. I see this as a intersectionality between leadership, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and conflict. My name is Arthur T. Matthews. I'm a senior fellow in Human Capital here at the Conference Board. In this session, we'll be hearing from three of my distinguished colleagues from Vivi, New York Presbyterian, and Horizon Media about how we can prepare ourselves for the return to office and support a workforce that addresses the needs of working parents and our employees. I think it's important for us to start today's conversation with a quotation from Helen Keller. She said, we must accomplish bigger things through doing smaller things. And I think it's important for us to think about her sphere of influence, how she was both visually and hearing impaired, but despite that, she was able to accomplish big things. Part of today's conversation is that the mapping part of it is being navigated by our three colleagues. And that's part of the conversation. Now, because we have 60 minutes, which is truncated of the 1,440 minutes we have in every day, this is a very ambitious agenda. We have a series of questions. I want to share with you just a couple of items that I think is important to create a good foundation for today's conversation. Just yesterday, Cranes reported through a survey that was done by the Partnership for New York City that 62% of Manhattan office workers were expected to return to the workforce at the beginning of the fourth quarter. And about 90 days ago, exactly to the day, Harvard Business School had a number of their faculty members talk about what they anticipated would be this repurpose, if you will, a reset. And I'm not going to share with you what all 12 faculty members said. I'm just going to give you the highlights. Number one, consider a flexible hybrid approach. I'll keep talking about caregiving and being absolutely compassionate. Uh, reject virtual work at your own company's peril and make sure we understand the stressors that everybody's going through. So I'm going to present to you the questions we have for today. And what I think we'll do is kind of have a kind of a round robin organic conversation with our three experts. You have their bios in front of you so that you know that they come from very interesting organizations from Vivi, New York Presbyterian, and Horizon Media. So the first question I think I'll present to Brett uh, to get us started, how are America's leaders thinking about returning to work? So, Brent, why don't you get us started with that? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, I think it's different this time, right? Um, this is not a normal return to work. This was a worldwide pandemic and shifted everything. We never had Zoom meetings. We never had, we never went about business the way that we're doing it now. Um, I work in healthcare. So, Working from home for many people still is not an option, but even for people that it's now an option for, we never considered that to be an option because we consider everyone that works for us a caregiver. So we want everyone to be on site. That's different now. Um, so I think everybody has to shift what they thought was normal to the, you know, I hate to say it's overused, but the new normal, right? And the, and the possibilities and the flexibility that didn't exist before. 
Absolutely. And Charles, what are your perspectives about this same question in terms of the leadership aspect? You know, it's interesting. I think, um, especially given the, the crowd that we have on the phone today and, and how thoughtful they've been about bringing people back to the office, because we, we've all been working throughout this entire time, right? It's just a little bit of a different situation where what we're talking about is how do we return to the office, but also how do we return to work post parental leave, maternity leave, paternity leave. And I think a lot of it sums down to like fundamental respect for the individual and thinking about it on what do people need? How do we serve one-to-one -one rather than one-to-many? Because when it comes to caregiving, when it comes to returning, when it comes to, it's all such a personal and such an intimate decision that what we see being most successful, and I think is embodied here by, by Britt and Eileen's perspectives, is really presenting options to people that they can then choose depending on their ability their need and where they really are, both in their time of life, but also geographically. Wonderful, thank you so much. And Eileen, last word on this question, how are America's leaders thinking about returning to work during the reset? Well, I, I agree uh, with Charles and what he's sharing in that it is very much a customized solution. I think if we approach it in a top-down, um, institutionalized way, we're going to miss out on the opportunity to create a new construct for what coming to work means and the difference between working in a physical headquarters versus working from home. I think the conversations that we're having at Horizon Media, they're, they're constant, they're regular. It is something that's keeping me up at night because it's so complex. And when you have, I know, Brit has a much larger organization to nav navigate than Horizon, but with our, you know, 2,000 plus employees, everybody's situation is different. Obviously, working parents have their own stressors, but when you look within inside the organization, we have client-facing teams, we have non-client-facing teams, and so when you think about the needs of each cohort throughout the organization, it really makes sense to be hybrid and customized to the degree that we can. And I think that personalization, as Charles says, it used to be one to many, it's one to one now. We're in advertising, so we understand what that means, particularly from a, from a media perspective. And it's very true for uh, what we need to be doing with our employees to preserve the culture and to preserve and ensure relevancy for the new workforce. Wonderful, and what I heard from the three of you in terms of a trifecta is number one is gonna require a higher level of emotional intelligence, so empathy and compassion. And number two, we need to be laser focused and top of mind in terms of our leadership capabilities, whether it's authentic leadership by Dr. Bill George or appreciative leadership by Dr. Diana Whitney, those leadership, if you will, strategies are gonna be even more important. So let's go to our second question what are some strategies to support working parents, especially mothers? And this is near and dear to me. Okay, so let's start this time with Charles. Um, thanks, Arthur. You know, this is obviously a really important question. And, and let's take a step back and look at what the macro numbers say, right? Childcare has long been a crisis for working families and care in general for working families. We know what those stats were, right? Before COVID, it meant that half of all full-time employed women would just never come back to the workforce after they had their first kid. And the average parent would miss 30 days of work per year. There's only 250 days in a work year. It's more than 10% of it. Um, COVID came and set the house on fire. Those aren't my words. Those are the St. Louis Fed's words. Um, and we know where it ends, right? Two and a half million women were forced out of the workforce. We like to say forced because it, it really characterizes what it is. Why? Well, 60% of them all child care capacity and all care capacity in general was shut down. And as a result of that, the average parent spent 30 hours more per week on care than before. There's only two places that you can pull 30 hours from. It's sleep and it's work. And it's not surprising then that that's exactly where families are pulling it from. We're on the phone right now, or we're on the call right now with a number of working parents and our children all different ages, right? But we've all had to deal with this in different ways. And frankly, as a result of that, you know, it shouldn't be surprising that turnover is up and productivity is down. There's significant levers that you can do there. The most important, I think, is being intentional. It's being intentional in what you want to achieve by working with, with families and by providing opportunities for them to lessen that blow, right? And so we've worked in a number of different ways. I think one of, you know, you can look at big numbers. There are really big reasons 
why employers should support their employees in this way, whether because it's the best investment that they can make, or it's the right thing to do, or just out of self-interest, the numbers don't lie. It's the most effective recruiting, retention, and productivity tool in existence. And so it's been um, really exciting to see the levers of those pulled, but really it's about trying to work backwards, right? You're looking at a direction that you wanna go in, and what are the steps that you have to take to get there from the toolbox that you need to assemble to the way that you communicate to your people to really ultimately trying to, it's, it's like building a product, right? You're testing, you're measuring, you're adjusting. Um, and it's been really exciting to see how that plays out across the board. I think one of the things that's been perhaps most inspiring in not only working with uh, Eileen and Britt on this, but seeing it across the board is the breadth of the way that people are really work, looking out to support their, their people. And again, there are a lot of different ways, but it comes down to that one-to-one -one perspective. And how do you how do you make that person feel supported? Because it, it, it's not a linear impact, right? When a child is able to succeed, the family succeeds. And when that happens, I mean, I'll, I'll let Britt and Eileen talk about what happens to the organization, right? Well, I think that epitomizes, I'm gonna to go to Eileen next. You meet people where they are. Everybody has a certain specialized circumstance and we have to have customized solutions going forward because we can't do this in a way that's roughshod because folks are looking for an elevation of how they're treated. And that goes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Folks are gonna be really strategic and tactical about the decisions they make going forward. Is my employer gonna really support me? And that's gonna be a very interesting, critical conversation going forward. Eileen, let's go to use. What are some strategies to support working parents, especially those moms out there, the sheroes and heroines, I call them? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's a very challenging time, but it's also very, it's a very exciting time because we're in a very transformative point in our trajectory in terms of where we're working and how we're working. And I think the most important thing is communication. And I think there is the potential for a communication gap, if we don't understand what the needs are of our employees, if we're not taking the pulse of where they're at and what they need, we're gonna miss out. Because I, I certainly don't wanna make an assumption, our leaders don't wanna make the assumption what our parents need. But it's also, yes, parents have a very unique need, but you also have other demographics within the organizations that have very different needs. When I think of those that are commuting up to four hours round trip a day, that's serious time that they can use in a much more positive, productive way. So to me, the first step is really, let's get the people together, let's start asking questions, like let's survey those parents to understand what are their challenges. Because they went, it was, it was almost easier to go offline a year and a half ago than it is to come back. One, because the coming back is an unknown, implement the strategies that our families have implemented to get to the point where they are now. Now they're faced with the pressure and the stress. Okay, I just figured this out. Now I have to re-figure it out again. So that's an, an added pressure. So we want to mitigate that for them, but we can't do it without understanding where they're at. And it's not going to be easy. This one-to-one -one is a much more complicated way of leading. But I, I call it, you mentioned authentic leadership, the purpose leadership. What I'm starting to look at is it's really relevant leadership. Like, how are we relevant to our employees to understand what they need and how do we meet them where they are? And I think so. The first step is understanding the the needs, and then also looking at what we've gained from the past year and a half. We've gained flexibility in ways that we could never have imagined. The nine to five day doesn't have to be nine to five. Maybe I need to start my day at ten and end later. Maybe we need to job share. Job sharing was a thing way back that was very popular many years ago, but I think it's kind of lost its relevancy. But I anticipate job sharing might be something that's coming back just as a means of bringing working moms back into the workplace as a means of finding that flexibility. So there's a number of ways in which we have to challenge our thinking about what the workday is like and be okay to flex a little bit differently. It's going to be really hard for leaders. It's a much more complex way to lead the diversity of a distributed workforce. But I think at the end, the relevancy and meeting our employees in a very interesting marketplace is gonna be more important than ever before. 
And I apologize, my dog may be barking. My dog is going to be barking in the background, so I apologize. That's okay. We're pet friendly. Don't worry about it, Eileen. Well, so one of the things, I think we do have a model before we get to Brent for job sharing and teleworking. And we don't think about this model because they're really kind of off grid but they're the second largest employer in the United States, and that's the federal government. If you go to telework.gov, you will see the Office of uh, if you Personal Management has an entire initiative. My partner and I have colleagues who work at the federal government, and they've been doing telework successfully for years. They're an organization with one million employees. So maybe for a change in terms of benchmarking and best practices, let's look at the federal government and how they're doing it, and maybe take some models from them that might be helpful, sustainable, and thought provocative. All right, Brett, let's go to you. What are some strategies to support working parents, especially the moms out there? So I think there's several different buckets that we have to kind of check off because you're talking about the caregiver and you're talking about the family because that's right. He, you know, it says mothers, but whoever the primary caregiver is, right? They have to take care of themselves and they have to take care of their family. So. Starting with the family, you child care. You have to have make sure that you have child care support. Um, I look at Charles when I say that. Um, that's his realm. Um, you have to look at tutoring resources. Um, we actually partnered with Vivi and did online tutors that we provided for our employees' children. Because now, not only is the caregiver but their child is asking them questions and needing help and also in school. So instead of the child being away at school, they're actually sitting right next to them or in the room next door and they need assistance. The caregiver has to do their job and their child's, be their child's teacher at the same time. And then emotional well-being and or mental health is a huge support that we are really spending a lot of time on at New York Presbyterian. Um, the emotional well-being of the employee, the emotional well-being of their children, um, their spouses, their whoever's living with them in their households. This pandemic has been an enormous burden on people. Um, people are worried, they're scared, they're nervous. Then you've got everything else going on um, with diversity and inclusion and racial injustice and, and so much getting thrown at everyone at one time. And people are now trying to figure out, as I mentioned, how to navigate what they used to know and everything's different. Um, their children are stressed out at home where, and isolated from their friends. That's totally not what they're used to. So it's like a multi-prong approach, right? You, you have to care for their emotional well-being and their children and do the supports like childcare and, and tutoring. Wonderful. And before we get to the next question, Brett, I wanna just follow up and this is totally anecdotal, but think about the friends in your orbit that you know that are now multi-generational in their household. So the caregiving model has really become all hands on deck. Think about children, their parents, and now their grandparents, because in many ways, a lot of families decided, you know what, during COVID, we need to be in a bubble together. So let's come together, let's work throughout. And I think this is fascinating that generations could speak and communicate with each other because how often do we have that? Usually the grandparents are in another state, but now grandparents are with their sons or daughters and with their grandkids, which is wonderful. And that's, even the grandparents are helping out, which is wonderful, right? And we can look at not traditional models of mentoring, but what about reverse mentoring? Where that 16 year old who's a junior in high school, right? Who needs caregiving assistance from the grandmother, but can teach the grandmother technology in the same space where they're sharing real estate. So I think that's absolutely fascinating. So wonderful. So Brett, we're gonna stay well, right with I, you. I will say before you yes. go on, I yes. actually do have, I have my mother-in-law living with us and I have a toddler and an infant and forget the 16 year old, my three year old is teaching my mother-in-law technology. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. I picked 16, I have a grandson 17, my wife and I, so uh, but yes, absolutely at that age, no age is a barrier to uh, what I call is lifelong learning, which is an amazing thing. So here's probably the toughest question for today because we're talking about cost benefit analysis, return on investment. And Brad, I'm gonna start with you. How do we measure ROI of returning to work and investing in parents? How do we do that 
and what kind of formula can we use? What's a tactic? What's a strategy? What are some best practices you think, worst practices? And then we'll go to Charlie and then we'll finish up with this question to Eileen. So Brett, what are your thoughts about this? So we look at a few things with ROI. Um, engagement is one. We look at our engagement scores year over year, especially you know, pre-pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic. We did a pulse survey on our employees and um, of course post-pandemic to see about engagement. And also um, employees who are calling out, whether they're calling out because they're not feeling good or they're calling out for what we kind of traditionally call the mental health day, like I just can't work today. Um, because we met, as healthcare providers, there are a lot of positions where if we have a nurse call out, we don't just say, oh, we're down a nurse. We then have to bring another nurse in. So now we're paying two people for that one position. So it's um, very costly for us to have call outs when we can avoid them. So um, that the more we invest in our employees' emotional well being, childcare, the less they're going to call out, the more the less double salaries we have to pay. So uh, for us financially, it's very easy to do an ROI and then also looking at engagement. Wonderful. Very good. Charlie, uh, what do you think yeah, about I, the ROI? Yes. Well, it's funny. It's a big part of what, not only what we do, but why we do what we do, right? Um, because it really does tie everybody together by working with employers to help provide ex access to exceptional care and learning it really makes everybody shine. And I'll just give you a couple of stats over here that that I'm really proud of, right? And so in particular with, with both Britt and, um, and Eileen, part of what I was so impressed by and, and what has made the organizations being such, such standouts in the crowd, uh, especially during the pandemic, is how responsive they've been to their employees. And, and they'll both talk about this at some point, right? But they've now served their, their folks across a number of different modalities, whether it's childcare, in a school, child care in the office, child care in people's homes, anywhere they are, virtual tutoring globally for children ages 6 to 18. What that tells you is it's really thinking holistically about the entire organization, but it's also thinking about equity and access to equitability. And, and there's a number of different ways to slice that. But, you know, when we work with New York Presbyterian, and, and you know, I think this shouldn't be a surprise, Britt said it before, they really do consider everybody to be a caregiver and so we've looked at everything on there when we when we talk about inclusion for virtual tutoring for example making sure that folks from across the different campuses have access to it that folks across different um, incomes have access to it right and as we start looking into the future about how do we make access you know scalable across the board that becomes powerful for Eileen and um, and horizon you know talk about an unbelievable shift that's really hit hit the nail on the head. Folks were using Vivi schools for, for backup care and then COVID hit. And pretty quickly we said, okay, people are gonna be everywhere. They're gonna be under a lot of stress and how do we support them? Because flexibility just isn't enough, right? You have to be deliberate about it and you have to support them. And Eileen and her team, to their credit, ran those ran those surveys, responded and they came to us. And Eileen, those, those numbers have reflected the strength of that, right? It's not about guessing, it's about serving. And so that's really powerful. When we look at it, we look at it from an outcomes perspective, retention, recruiting, and productivity, and then also loyalty. And so, yes, we measure the NPS scores, and yes, we measure the engagement, but at the end of the day, we also know that, you know, NYP was able to save 3,500 shifts last year as a result of, of their work here, right? And that 100% of the moms that worked with Vivi through Horizon stuck around. In an environment like that, it becomes really powerful to say that, and it's just the work of our lives to be able to serve and honor them in that way. And so when we think about it, we really think about how are we making our employers a better place to work, uh, giving them a competitive advantage, and really honoring the people who are going in there every day and getting their hands dirty to support the broader mission. That's wonderful. That's a good conversation about ROI. Okay, Eileen, we're gonna go to you. Okay, so as Charles alluded to it to some degree, but the the anecdotal ROI is really powerful. I love getting emails from our employees that say, thank you so much for providing the services of Vivi. Um, and, and I really hear the, the emotional um, joy and mitigating the stress of the benefits. And as we've expanded the services of Vivi over the past year, I mean, it has been almost life-saving for them and that they're able to manage 
their work with, the, with their kids' needs. So that's that's one light ROI. But really, when we look at the, the way in which we survey the organization, we have something that's called a pulse survey. It's called the Echo, which is your emotional connection to Horizon. And we last to the past year plus, we were posting on a monthly basis all sorts of questions around working from home. What are their issues? What are the challenges with the return or coming back to the office? What are your child care issues? And it really gave us a lot of insight about, one, what, what are the challenges that our employees are facing? Then we were able to strategize, implement some of the strategies that we talked about earlier, and then re again to see what the movement has been as we started to address um, the issues that they raised. The other area is we do a leadership, a, lead, a recent leadership assessment about how are our leaders showing up against our ethos. And our ethos are steeped in being an agency of belonging and recognizing right. the individuality of each of our employees. So we're in that process right now to see how our leaders are showing up as leaders for their community. So that's a very interesting touch point. And we'll resurvey again later this year. And we've conducted a tremendous number of focus groups. So we're really able to engage in conversation, asking the relevant questions, hearing directly in conversation what's on the minds of our employees, what are their stressors, what are their concerns, what's working well for them, because I think it's equally important to recognize what's working well as opposed to what isn't, so we can start to leverage and build on what has been a positive experience. And so the focus groups combined with our Pulse survey, combined with a leadership assessment, really gives us a good understanding of what's going on within the organization. It's not perfect uh, by any stretch, but it gives us some data points, several data points to understand how we're tracking, you know, month to month or quarter to quarter or even based on the circumstances in which we're trying to understand what's going on for our employees. The other is we have uh, several business uh, business resource groups. One of them is called Horizon Village. Horizon Village is dedicated to our working parents. And I spend a lot of time understanding what are the challenges from the employees who are part of Village. They recently sent me just an email two days ago. They had a meeting and I will be meeting with them again. So it's not somebody sitting behind a screen, but really sitting behind a screen, but engaging with them um, in this way to really hear directly what's on their minds. And it's not, it's not just child care that's on their minds. It's also how, how do they return to a public setting with all that's going on still with COVID? Is it going to be a vax environment? Is it going to be a non-vax environment? How does that carry back into my home if I have kids in the demographic that aren't vax yet? So it's, there's so many layers to what we need to understand for our employees. And the more we talk to them, the more we understand what's going on, the better we can move forward in a positive way. Well, it's serendipitous, Eileen, that you mentioned focus groups, because I was going to exercise some executive privilege and ask the three of you your thoughts of the focus groups process. The four of us know, and many of our listeners and viewers know, that it's a really good qualitative tool to look at perceptions and opinions and feelings and observations. And I'm wondering how many of our colleagues who are out there uh, have used focus groups in the past. And maybe we can just, Brett and then Charles, uh, talk about the ROI of focus groups, because I know a lot of times we're very survey oriented, which is more quantitative. I think a bridge, if you will, a hybrid, is including both ideologies, because guess what? Your adult learners at your organizations are different. They want different pedagogy and jagagi. They're visual, they're kinesthetic, they're auditory. So I think using a blended approach could be a real return on investment. But I'd like to hear from you, Brad and Charles, how have you used focus groups in your work in the past? And do you think this would be a really good time to maybe accelerate the focus group? And for those that haven't done them, folks, the playbook says 10 to 12 folks. You don't want your focus groups to have a really large number of folks because the key is validating the perspectives of the folks in that group. You want everybody to have a voice. You want everybody to be heard. You want everybody to be validated. So, Brett, if you can talk a little bit about the focus group process and how it's worked for you, and then we'll go to Charles. So this is such a timely question for me because we are just rolled out focus groups. Um, 
for our well-being, um, specifically emotional well-being at this time. So we have about 50 focus groups scheduled uh, between now That's and all the just end of 50, the Brit? Just 50? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just 50. Um, well, we have 40,000 employees, so. Oh, I know. I'm just teasing um, you. That's great. It's music to my ears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have them at all times. We have we have focus groups scheduled in the middle of the night because we have our, you know, we're 24-7. So we have a night shift that we really want to make sure their voices get heard. We have, um, well, so let me back up. So the focus groups are starting this week, actually. We went through training, facilitator training. We have an organizational development team who are experts in facilitating focus groups. They are trained. That is what they do. So they have trained uh, my team to be facilitators. And to your point, Arthur, uh, respect is utmost importance when we're doing focus groups, making sure that they know it's a safe space, making sure they know how important it is for their voice to be heard. Uh, we are we have well-being coaches that are on site at all of our hospitals and they're actually going to the groups or departments that aren't in front of a computer like your environmental services or right. as housekeepers and food service and transport all the people that make caregiving possible but they're not in front of a computer they're literally running around doing patient care all day so our coaches are going to them and allowing and facilitating, bringing the computer for them so that they can participate in focus groups because it wouldn't be a focus group if we didn't hear their voice too. Um, so really making sure that we are getting participation from all of our sites. You know, we have 10 campuses, we have off sites, we have corporate, we have day shift, night shift, evening shift, weekend, per diem. We really want to hear all of it. I think the hardest part when I was working with organizational development on our focus groups was paring it down to have a 90 minute conversation. Because they <laughs> right. said to me, what do you want to know? I said, I want to know everything. I want to know what they want about every kind of a support. Um, and, you know, our um, expert Kate said, okay, Britt, that's not possible in 90 minutes. So let's <laughs> pare it down. So I think that was actually the hardest for me is to like dampen my excitement and try to focus a little so that we can get the feedback. So I am super excited to come back in August and put all the notes together and figure out what are they asking for? Because we right. offer a lot of different programs at NYP. The question is, do they know about them? Are they able to access them? And if not, what are the barriers? And is that what even the, what they're even looking for? Maybe that's right. what we think they're looking for, and they're looking for something totally different. To Eileen's right. point, what they needed pre-pandemic is different than what they needed post-pandemic. So um, focus groups have been very difficult prior to uh, COVID because we didn't have Zoom, and it was literally running around New York, 10 different locations, different shifts. It was just almost impossible to get everybody's voices heard. And so we really relied on surveys, which we all know, like you said, is qualitative and difficult. So now that we have Zoom, all of a sudden we have all these opportunities that have opened where we can really get to people and hear their voices. So if you can't tell, I'm super excited about my <laughs> It sounds like it. Well, first of all, congratulations on your launch. And just to reiterate the importance of what everyone's saying here who are not that familiar with the focus group process, it's an opportunity for voices to be heard that would normally not be heard. And I think it's important at the beginning, as we all know, the four of us, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners, you have to remind folks at the beginning, it's an inclusive process and everything that's said is confidential. There's no attribution to what you say in this focus group. We're just looking for the data points and what comes out of the focus group. And of course, showing our appreciation. And the fact that we actually are asking people what they think is really a change for a lot of folks. And that's a healthy thing. So Charles, your perspective on focus groups and I'll get, we'll get to our last question. You know, it's, it's a really interesting thing. And the way that we think about it is we really have three customers. We have our teachers who are our customers in a lot of ways, right? If you think about the experience that any of you have, have had with childcare or even your own experience as, as having gone through it, your relationship maybe to the institution, but it's really to the people that you've built those relationships with, right? That's what makes it so special. 
And so every single day when we send out hundreds of teachers and hundreds of tutors to work with families, each of those is a point that needs to be of the highest quality for those families and everybody else. And, and if they're not happy, they're not gonna be doing a great job, right? So um, there's not only the families, there's the teachers, and then there's the companies who are helping to, to support this. And so I really look at each of those as an opportunity to help drive our product development, right? Um, and it's a weird way to talk about it from, from a caregiving perspective, but it helps create some discipline around it. And so Eileen and Britt and I have, have had been hours on the phone discussing what families need based on the data that they've pulled. But when we onboard a family, we also take a pulse from them. And that's a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody from our family experience team who's really understanding how they liked the onboarding session, what they're hoping to get out of it. And that's always something that we try to get to. What would you like to get out of this? Because when they start expressing that, they, it starts actuating it almost to some extent. Right. And we find that to be really helpful. And then finally, if somebody leaves for whatever reason, they, maybe they have another opportunity, their child is aged up, whatever that they leave the company, we also have that conversation. It's all about collecting those data points. And one of my favorite things that we've done is we've taken a whole number of testimonials that we've gotten either spoken to and transcribed or had people send in and we put them into like a word bubble. So we've been able to see what are the things that keep on popping out and words like responsive and considered right. and productive and relief. You know, on paper, all of these big stats look, look really nice. 50% reduction in headcount turnover, 40% increase in focus. What happens when a nurse has 40% more focus? Fewer people die, right? What happens when a working mom is able to be 25% more productive at Horizon? Means more client work gets done and more client work gets won. Um, there are second and third and fourth level impacts that are important to understand, but also to measure across this. And so there's not only that conversation, but it's the meta conversation that comes off of it that we find right. so helpful to look at and measure and then, and then reflect back on, right? It's, What's happening? What did you want to happen? What actually happened? This is what you told me. This is how it happened, right? It's just a constant loop of that like, we're on the same page. Well, Charles, you mentioned something really important that we always we don't always think about. You know, a lot of times we know the ROI of focus groups, but offering those one-on-one -on -one conversations, I call them synthesizing sessions, is a beautiful thing because think about it. Even though a focus group may be ten to twelve in terms of the number of attendees or participants, there may be somebody who has a level of anxiety and trepidation and reticence who may not be comfortable even with 10 of their colleagues. So why not offer these one-on-one -on -one conversations to folks because you really still want to validate their perspective. And that requires a lot of pivoting, uh, especially if folks need it. But guess what? If you're going to do this process, you've got to have a lot of different models. You can't have a cookie cutter approach. So if somebody needs an audience one-on-one -on -one, with one of your facilitators, guess what? We got to try to make it happen on that midnight to eight shift, right, Brett? So we've got to try to make it happen because we want everybody to be all hands on deck. And I think that's important. Okay. All right. Last question. What are some examples from industries that can serve as blueprints? And maybe we'll start with you, Eileen. Um, can you elaborate on when you say blueprint exactly? Just you, what, some what are you looking for? Best practices you've heard better practices, maybe some worse practices. I call the good, bad, ugly, and oogly. So okay. whatever you've anything, heard or anything, seen, th that's right, exactly. So, <laughs> but the blueprint question is, we want to see something that's the gold standard. Do we know of any, and of course, Vivi does a lot of it and has partnered with the two of you, but what are some examples from industries, whether it's healthcare, whether it's media, whether it's government, whether it's NGOs, 501c3s, uh, whether it's standard corporate corporations, labor unions, what are some industries that can serve as blueprints in this whole d dynamic that we're talking about today? And especially as you start. Go ahead, Charles. Go ahead, Charles. No, I was going to say, especially as, as both of you have experienced this on your end, what have you used as inspiration for, for, for your blueprints to, to return back? I think it goes back to where we, when we first started about the importance of one-to-one -one and the personalization and customization. So it really depends on your culture. And I think the cultural component of each industry and each organization is a, a real driver in determining what you can do. So I have a tendency to not necessarily look 
to follow what others are doing. Yes, it's important to understand what's happening as a best practice or as, I don't even want to say best, I will just say as practices throughout different industries. But what really, I think, where you get the home run is really taking a look at your culture, understanding your ethos, understanding what your organization is about, what's the appetite for and what's the appetite not for what you can actually implement. So the relevancy of your culture um, and the industry that you're in is really important. And I think that's the first kind of, if you look at your blueprint, it's really map out what that is. We're a media agency. We have clients. We're in the service business. business. So that is a very significant driver of what we can do to accommodate both our clients as well as our employees. And I think when you were talking, Charles, about the one-to-one, when we're talking about focus groups, I think leadership has a really important role to make connections to their teams, to their employees. And what really matters moving forward is that sense of community, the sense of camaraderie, and the sense of connection. So as long as you can hit on those three within your organization and within your team, I think that is actually the blueprint from my perspective of success for success because if you have that if you're disconnected it doesn't matter what you do people are really looking to organizations and leadership more now than ever it's not about work-life integration it's not about work-life balance it's about helping our employees work life shift it's really about the shifting that's going on from a transformation perspective and they're looking to leadership to get more involved with helping navigate and we don't want to get in the, in the business of, of leading people's lives but we are in that business because when we look at the whole person showing up and understanding who the whole person is that's part of the blueprint as well and understanding where we where the employee starts and stops and the employer picks up in order to help them understand help the employees navigate their lives because work is one aspect of their life Absolutely. And Brett, before you answer, I just want to mention and articulate that this webcast is made possible through the support of our sponsor, Vivi. Uh, the face of Vivi is Charles. Uh, they have a wealth of information, institutional knowledge, and we'd love for you to be able to connect with them after the program concludes. Please make sure to respond to the survey on your screen, connect with our sponsor partner, and select Sure, and please share my contact information. We really appreciate that because they are in their own way, setting the gold standard in this conversation in this space. Okay, so let's go to Brett with this last question, and maybe we should go back to it, Brett, because you're at a competitive disadvantage because you can't see it. Okay, what are some <laughs> examples from industries that can serve as blueprints? So what kind of industries do we think that we can look at that clearly have transferable skills that many of our supporters of this webcast could look at? Oh, so of course, I'm, I'm besides gonna... NYP, and besides NYP, right? <laughs> uh, although I am going to take a little bit of a spin like Eileen did and, and say, you know, we are healthcare, so we can't, we can take some blueprints from some companies, but, but we are caregivers, right? We're not making widgets. We're very different. So for us, I love, you know, Eileen, what you said about the whole person and the holistic view of your employees, because that is so true. I think support is number one, what we need to use as our blueprint. We got hit with the pandemic, what, 16 months ago, came to New York hard. Nobody knew what it was. Everybody was scared. And we expected our employees to come to work and face something that they didn't even know what it was and put themselves at risk. If they don't feel supported, why would they do that? Why would they go out there and put themselves in that situation and risk themselves and their families if they don't have the support. We did it as an entire entity. We as a as an organization fought the fight. So whether we were in the ER, whether we were in the ICU or whether we were in corporate, because we had our, you know, people that were in corporate went to the hospital and did what they could do and everybody volunteered and people took different positions and people did everything that they could do because we had the mentality that we are all in this together and that we are supporting each other. And luckily the, the pandemic looks like it's, you know, on its way out and knocking on wood here, but we want to continue that feeling of support. 
it doesn't end when the pandemic ends. It's not like, great, thanks, now, now you're back on your own again. We are continuing to support our employees and we are continuing to operate as one entity, one organization. So if you have a childcare issue, it's our issue, right? Um, we can't, yes, there's a fine line between living your lives and, and where the employer is, but if you have an issue, if you're stressed out because you can't pay your bills and then you're not paying attention at work, then that's our issue. And we wanna make sure that above and beyond our employees feel supported and cared for so that they can come to work and care for and support our patients. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we've got about nine minutes or so left, and I'm going to answer a question. We've unpacked, if you will, these four questions. And I mentioned at the very beginning the foundation that I thought there were three disciplines in particular that were connected to the conversation, leadership, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and conflict. So here's my question for any of you that want to answer. How do we make sure that we minimize or mitigate the conflict that may naturally or organically come out of these kinds of initiatives, because you're gonna have change resistors, right? We're gonna have folks like the three of you who are absolutely change implementers, change initiators, and change disruptors. They're gonna be folks that are gonna be professional derailers, right? And professional pot stirrers. How do we deal with those folks? And we know the statistics. 10% of your employees generate 90% of the conflict. So how do we deal with them? How do we make sure that we validate their perspective? Because they've got complaints and grievances and concerns, and they're banging on top of the drum. How do we deal with the conflict that's naturally part of an initiative like this? This is really unprecedented, because when's the last time we had a pandemic? 1918. You know, most of us were not even around at that time. So how are we going to deal with the conflict quotient and the conflict that will naturally ensue? And anybody can get us started quickly on this conversation. Who would like to start? Eileen, well, you look like great, you're smiling very widely. Yes. <laughs> well, it's a great question, and it's a really hard question to answer. Uh, we're in this, we're in it right now. We have a very entrepreneurially led organization, so our leaders are empowered to make decisions based on this hybrid model. So you you might have different outcomes based on the on each leader, and so I I like to lean into those. Um, early adopters of the change and understand how that's impacting their organization and then leverage that for the areas where maybe it's not quite as readily being adopted. And I think when we go back to the ROI, retention is a big factor here because if you're, if we're not meeting our employees where they are in this marketplace, they're going to find somebody who can. And, and we want to, retain our top talent. We want to ensure that we're able to provide an environment that's meaningful and relevant to our community. So I think that that's one way in which we're doing it. Um, but we're not there yet. We're still, we're in those conversations. They're very, they're very hot. They're very lively at the moment. And I, I do hear from employees where they're, they are concerned. What if I have a leader who's not as progressive or not as apt to change as others? And I think it's going back to what we talked about in terms of that one-to-one -one and engaging the leaders with the employees and also tapping to other resources. We have um, community talent directors, and those are the equivalents of an HR business partner. And if we can engage with the, the CPM to facilitate those conversations and ask the right questions to understand What's the fear behind the change and really understand what the resistance is? Maybe we can start to open up a little bit of the possibilities for those areas that there might be a little bit more reserved to that change. Absolutely. And I just want to unpack quickly. You mentioned the word fear, Eileen. There are three definitions. F-E-A-R, fear everything and run, face everything and recover, false evidence appearing real. So what are we going to choose, right? Which is going to be it? We don't know. It depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Charles, how are you dealing with conflict? What's what's next? Where's the playbook? You know, it's it's really interesting, and I have to answer all of these from both angles, right? There's a lot of joy in my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> We're dealing with people's children. That's right. And oftentimes when we come there, there's like literal tears of joy of like, oh my God, I didn't know what I was going to do otherwise. And again, that's not to brag. It's just to say that like, I'm really fortunate that we get to deal Awesome. with like our job is to be the best part of people's day right because if we don't we're leaving something on the table over there in a lot of ways we consider ourselves 
know, this is hospitality, the expression of which happens to be exceptional care and learning. Um, but the second hand, like where we do see some stuff or like where we do have to do messaging is sometimes there's employees who might say, well, I don't have any kids or I have kids that are out of the age group over here. What about me? The best way that we found to handle this is, is really a two or three fold approach. The first is really communication. Right. And it's talking about how this is something that, that you know, everybody works with a parent or has a parent that works for them or alongside them. And what we find is that this bottleneck, like everybody wants to work with somebody who's happier and more productive. It makes the organization sing a lot more. The second is delivering more services to broader people. Again, talking about not only focusing on children ages zero to five, but also offering the virtual tutoring and camp for kids ages six to 18. It's about having this, this broad omni-channel approach that meets people where they are. Right. Um, and then finally, it really is about, you know, how do we talk about, about equity? How do we talk about the equitable distribution versus the equal distribution of this stuff? And it's really talking about, okay, parents may need support on XYZ and children may need support on ABC. You're able to get it in this other place. It's a cultural thing that we're really proud to play a part of. Internally, um, a big part of this beating heart of Vivi is our teachers. It's having those meetings every day. And, and it goes from the teachers to the head teachers, school, to the general managers, right? And it's everybody constantly communicating. It's not easy, but you have to have a big heart and you have to have, have a lot of elbow grease. And, and people tend to give the benefit of the doubt around that, which I think is really, really powerful. Right. Well, listen, it sounds like servant leadership. Robert Greenleaf would be very happy to hear how infectious <laughs> things are at Vivi for sure. Okay, and Brett, how are we dealing with conflict at MYP? Uh, listen, uh, we can only imagine, right, being in a healthcare oh. environment. Um, similar to Eileen, we do have HR business partners. Um, and really, I think they, they're they kind of again, the boots on the ground for any issues that employees may have. And generally, when there is conflict, it's really about finding out what is underneath that conflict, right? right. Is it, you know, you did mention the, the three definitions of fear. Like, what is it about this change that's really bothering? Is it an equity issue? Is it because you're scared and you've never done it before? Do you right. just need someone to hold your hand through it? It's generally not the actual change that's the problem or the the policies that are going to be different. It, right. It's something else underneath that's a little bit bigger and a little more personal that they're upset about. So I think just talking to someone and finding out where is that conflict coming from gives us a better sense and then we can adjust accordingly. Um, again, individualizing as, as needed, but sometimes it's just a little bit of handholding. Hey, it's pointing out the equity if that's the issue or handholding and saying, let me sit down with you. Let me show you this new system to chart in. It's actually not that bad. Or let me find, let me show you where the, the tips are to make things go a little faster. And then it kind of eases them in. And then it's amazing how much uh, employee to employee, supporting each other gets through the change. Because once one person's comfortable, then they turn around and say, oh, I've done this before, let me show you. Or I've done this, I know what, I know how this goes, or I've tried this before, let me help you. And then, you know, it's different to hear a policy or something from HR versus your colleague saying, oh no, it's not that bad, I've done it before. So I think getting the word out and getting people through that, you know, fear or unknown, and then really supporting each other based on uh, feedback from the colleagues and getting colleagues to support you. That's right. And as the four of us know, all conflict is not created equal. So we may need to look at how do we avoid, accommodate, compete, compromise, or collaborate, depending on the nature of the conflict. So let's go through as we really go through the rest of our time together. There are earned credits through HRCI, SHRM, CPE, Folks, if you click on a CEU request widget, uh, you can sign up for credit. We want to make sure that we're embracing your journey uh, to be and continue to sustain your lifelong learner status. Okay, so we want to make sure that you're part of that conversation. And we're going to continue here. We talked about our sponsor, Vivi. And there's some upcoming webcasts that's coming up from the conference board. Human Capital Watch Driving Recovery Through a Highly Skilled Workforce which is right around the corner on June 15th. 
uh, what to do about culture crash, which is uh, 10 days later, and why financial wellness is integral to your diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, all in June, believe it or not. Okay, and there's a new podcast series that we were told to talk about, C-Suite Perspectives, Insights for What's Ahead. Uh, we ask that you participate in that as well, continue the conversation, and continue to have important dialogue. It's a very important narrative for us to engage in. Uh, My TCB, the conference board, is a customized convenient access uh, to all the content that's available here at the conference board. We'd like for you to be part of that as well. And then there's a conference coming up. There's a lot of things happening, as you can see, at the conference board, change and transformation. I talked a little bit about being a change initiator, a change facilitator, a change resistor, or even a change disruptor, which many of us have been that are part of the panel today. And this one is a virtual event, of course, recovery, reinvention, and resilience. And we wanted to make sure you knew about that as well. So I think we have reached the end. Are there any key words, key phrases that Charles, you, Britt, or Eileen would like to share as we depart today? Any lasting words? And then I'll close it out in just uh, two or three minutes. Anything else, any words that resonate with and for you about going forward? Just okay, go ahead, Brad, and then Eileen. I think uh, the things that I've heard over and over from myself, Charles, Eileen, you, Arthur, is flexibility, um, support. Those are the two kind of that I, I, I know Eileen's got one too, and I, I also agree. Okay, I think we lost Brett there for a minute. Okay, Eileen, you want to jump in? No. Well, I think customization, I think, is really important and really recognizing the the human influence, if you will, about what we're about to embark on. And it is hard. I think what we're talking about is all very difficult, but it doesn't mean we have to shy away. I think we have to embrace it Yes, it's gonna challenge us in new ways, but I think the outcome is worth it. Um, but just recognize that we can talk about it in the way that we're discussing, but it doesn't mean that we want we have all the answers and that it's easy, but sometimes when it's really difficult, you get the greatest reward at the, on the other end. That's right, thank you. And Charles, last word. You know, I think it's such an inspiring time to spend time with all three of you. Um, and, and to really hear about how you think about serving your people. That's what I keep on hearing, right? How do we serve our people? How do we honor them? How do we invest in them? And it really comes down for me to look at this and say, everybody is spending here. You get to make the choice of whether it's an investment or not. Um, and it's about what you're trying to get out of it, how you're trying to serve your people and how you want them to feel about it. Um, because everybody is going to remember how they were treated and how others were treated coming out of here, it's gonna make lasting impressions that last a lifetime, that last a decade. Um, it's such a unique and awesome opportunity and responsibility to be able to change the way that these families and these people experience the world around them. Absolutely. And last but not least, I wanna share a final quotation from Maya Angelou, who was an author and a writer. She said, we must celebrate and recognize the contributions of our sheroes and heroes Let's give a nice round of applause to our three speakers today. But also this means they have shepherded this conversation. They've galvanized us. Now they have weaponized you. So we want you to understand the spirit of influence and the responsibility that you have now to really follow the playbook that was established today. We want to thank you for your time today. And Charles, Britt, Eileen, thank you. It was great sharing real estate with you. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.